Good afternoon and welcome to the first Bureau of Customs webinar entitled BOC Webinar on Customs Policies and Operations. I am one of your moderators, Dexter Buta Jr. Adhering to the new normal, this webinar aims to address the issues and concerns affecting the performance of the BOC. This webinar shall also give an update on customs policies and operations that needs to be observed by every client transacting with the BOC system. And I'm Joe Doronila. Today's session has four main objectives. First is to spread awareness among the BOC stakeholders on customs programs. Second one is to address the issues and concerns on customs policies and regulations. Third is to better serve our stakeholders and meet their needs and expectations. And lastly, to generate inputs from our stakeholders in order to determine the operational effectiveness of the Bureau. This afternoon, our well-rounded and respected speakers will discuss six topics, namely port operations, value reference system, selectivity system, E2M stabilization, customs accreditation, and fines and surcharges. These subjects will be discussed by a designated expert under the division concerned. Formally welcome us. We are pleased to introduce to you the Bureau of Customs Assistant Commissioner and Head of Post Clearance Audit Group. Please welcome Attorney Vincent Philip C. Maronilia. Our friends and stakeholders to the Bureau of Customs webinar on customs policies and operations today. Our two Deputy Commissioners, our Deputy Commissioner for uh, Assessment and Operations and the Deputy Commissioner for Revenue Collection and Monitoring Group will brief you on the updates of uh, our streamlined operations that uh, affects our port operations and of course our policies on fines and surcharges. Uh, there will also be discussions on the Enhanced Value Reference Information System uh, to be headed by uh, our representative from the Import Assessment Service, of course the head of the account management, uh, one of the heads of the account management office uh, will also be discussing their updates and programs uh, in terms of customs accreditation. Uh, our chief IT personnel from the Management Information and Systems Technology Group will also be updating you on uh, our programs in terms of E2M stabilization. So we'll be briefed about what the Bureau of Customs is doing in terms of uh, maintaining and uh, trying to stabilize our uh, E2M system, our online systems, during this very critical moment uh, in our country's history. Lastly, uh, our chief of the uh, risk management office will also be discussing with you uh, the current selectivity system, uh, especially the current uh, color-coded system that uh, has been adopted by the Bureau of Customs to address uh, some of the issues and concerns of our valued stakeholders, especially in terms of uh, examination, evaluation of uh, your particular shipments. Uh, so uh, without further delay, uh, again, let me welcome you and thank you for joining us today. This will be a uh, regular briefing and a regular webinar that the Bureau of Customs will be conducting to be able to keep our stakeholders and our friends uh, updated on the developments of uh, whatever it is that we're doing uh, to improve our systems for the betterment of not just the Bureau of Customs but for the service of uh, the government uh, to our stakeholders and to the Filipino people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Assistant Commissioner, for that heartfelt and meaningful message. And now, we would like to inform our dear stakeholders regarding the guidelines to be observed during the webinar. All our stakeholders attending this webinar and those who are watching us live can raise their questions and concerns via the Zoom chat box or Facebook live comment section. We can accommodate up to a maximum of three questions per topic and our open forum will be held after all presentations are done. But don't worry because all unanswered questions will be collated and will be answered at the soonest possible time. For our first speaker to talk about port operations, we are pleased to introduce to you the Deputy Commissioner for Assessment and Operations Coordinating Group, Attorney Edward James DeBuco. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will discuss with you port operations. This presentation includes the topics on average utilization of the ports of Davao, CDO, 
MCT, Cebu, Batangas, Subic, Puerto Manila, and the MICP covering the period of January to September 2020. The disposition of seized, abandoned, forfeited, and overstaying cargoes will also be discussed. Yard utilization is the ratio of number of storage slots or the number of containers on hand to the number of available slots or the terminal capacity. This bar graph shows the average yard utilization rate for the seven ports covering the period of January to August 2020. For the said period, the Port of Manila had the highest average yard utilization with 65.52%, followed by the Manila International Container Port and MCT Cagayan de Oro with 60.75% and 53.48% respectively. Yard utilization rate in the major ports, especially in the Port of Manila and MICP, are being monitored and reported every day to ensure that we maintain the rate within global standard which is not more than 70%. For the period of September 2020, the port of Davao had the highest average yard utilization rate with 80.33%, followed by the port of Manila and MICP with 69.93% and 66.86% respectively. Let's go now to disposition of seized, abandoned, forfeited, and overstaying cargoes. Pursuant to Executive Order No. 127, Series of 1987, the Assessment and Operations Coordinating Group, or AOCG, is mandated to monitor the disposal of seized, abandoned, forfeited, and overstaying cargoes in all ports. As of October 2, 2020, there are 4,344 overstaying containers in the ports. To expedite the immediate disposal of these cargoes, a series of memoranda were issued to all ports directing them to dispose the same. And every Monday in the regular Execom meeting, reports are made as to the number of overstaying containers being disposed. The disposal does not only raise traditional revenue for the government, but also unclogs the ports of overstaying cargoes to ease container traffic. From January of this year up to date, we have already disposed 2,522 overstaying containers. What are the modes of disposition? They are by public auction, donation, official use of the Bureau, negotiated sale, re-exportation, destruction or condemnation, or turnover to proper government agencies. Under Section 4.2 of CAO 3-2020, goods subject to disposition can be disposed in any of the following manner. Public auction. Public auction is done within 30 calendar days after a 10-day notice or in case of perishable goods within 5 calendar days after a 3-day notice. Donation. Donation to another government agency upon approval of the Secretary of Finance or donation to DSWD in case of goods suitable for shelter, foodstuffs, clothing materials, or medicines. Official use of the Bureau. Goods subject to disposition after approval of the Secretary of Finance and goods which means which remain unsold after at least two public biddings may be declared for official use of the Bureau. Negotiated sale. Goods which remain unsold after at least two public bidings are, that are not suitable either for official use or donation may be sold through a negotiated sale subject to the approval of the Secretary of Finance and executed in the presence of a COA representative. Re-exportation. Government property of goods not disposed through the aforesaid manner or of goods Injurious to public health may be re-exported. It shall be done pursuant to international agreements and treaties. Destruction or condemnation. Goods subject to disposition, such as restricted goods, which are highly dangerous to be kept or handled. Goods absolutely prohibited. Goods that are prohibited by law to be released. Goods that have no commercial value and goods that are injurious to public health 
can be disposed through destruction or condemnation upon the order of the district collector. And lastly, turn over to pro proper government agencies. Turn over to proper government agencies as provided in Section 1146 and Section 1147 of the CMTA. It can be turned over to the Armed Forces of the Philippines, PAGCOR, PCSO, PDEA, or the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. This is the process flow chart of public auction. Goods shall be sold or otherwise disposed of at the port where the goods are located unless the commissioner shall direct the transfer of the place of auction to another port. Notwithstanding the foregoing, jurisdiction over the disposition of the goods shall remain with the district that seized and forfeited the same. Registration in public bidding. Entities or persons interested to participate in every public auction must register with the port concerned and apply and comply with the following requirements. 1. Submission of a valid government ID. 2. Payment of non-refundable registration fee of 5,000 pesos and legal research fee of 50 pesos. And 3. Clearance or registration from the concerned government agencies in case of regulated goods. For donation, all requests for donations shall be coursed through the Commissioner, the Action Cargo Disposal Monitoring Division, POS AOCG, then endorse the same to all ports for determination of the availability of the items requested for donation. If available, the port concerned verifies the actual condition of the goods. The draft deed of donation shall set forth the condi conditions, if any. The approval of the Secretary of Finance shall be secured. In cases concerning COVID-19 donations, approval of the Secretary of Finance is not required and the donated goods shall be turned over directly to the Office of Civil Defense. Negotiated Sale The new Negotiated Sale Committee is headed by the Deputy Commissioner RCMG. The Negotiated Sale Committee conducts ocular inspection of the sale lots or items. It has the power to reject any or all offers or any part thereof and considers the offer or offers most advantageous to the interest of the government. The negotiated sale committee has also the power upon approval of the commissioner to recommend to the Secretary of Finance the acceptance of the offer or offers. Condemnation Goods mentioned earlier which are goods subject to disposition, such as restricted goods, which are highly dangerous to be kept or handled, goods absolutely prohibited, goods that have no commercial value, and goods that are injurious to public health, shall be condemned in the following manner. 1. Rendering. 2. Crushing. 3. Burning. 4. Breaking. 5. Shredding. And 6. Any other appropriate method. Upon receipt of the notice of finality of order of forfeiture or decree of abandonment, a detailed condemnation plan shall be prepared by the Auction and Cargo Disposal Division or equivalent unit of the port. The condemnation committee then evaluates and recommends to the district collector the approval of the order of condemnation together with the name of the contractor who will perform the destruction. Interested contractors shall be accredited by the district collector of the port, which shall be valid within three years from the date of accreditation. The applicant shall submit to the accreditation committee of the reports the requirements listed under Section 9.7 of CAO 3-2020. After the approval of the district collector of the order of condemnation, a corresponding gate pass and notice of condemnation for the release of goods will be issued by the chief ACDD to the chosen accredited contractor. Containers with goods for condemnation are now subjected to e GPS device on the way to the condemnation facility. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very informative session, DEPCOM Dibuko. Again, you can raise your questions via Zoom chat and FB Live comment section for the open forum after all the presentations. At this point, to discuss the BOC value reference system, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Romeo L. Lineses, COO5. 
Good morning everyone. I am Romeo Bilenesis Jr. from the Imports and Assessment Service and I am tasked today to discuss to you the Value Reference Information System. On this topic, we will try to discuss or answer the following questions. Number one, what is the EVRIS or the Enhanced Value Reference Information System? What are its key features? What are the enhancements? And most importantly, how does the EVRIS actually works? So what is the Enhanced Value Reference Information System or the EVRIS? The EVRIS is actually one of the customs modernization project of the Bureau of Customs which aims to enhance the existing value reference information system for it to be at par with internationally accepted standards. So as you can see on the screen, it was formally launched on August 17, 2020 by virtue of CMO 16-2020. It was developed in collaboration with Web Fontaine Group for it to be specifically WTO compliant. And just to give a short background on the EVRIS or the Web Fontaine Group, actually the Web Fontaine Group is one of is one of the leading experts on customs and trade facilitation projects and they have already developed various successful customs and trade related projects worldwide. The EVRIS is a risk management tool that allows customs officers to determine possible undervaluation and or trade misinvoicing of imported goods. But the EVRIS is not just a risk management tool. So what makes EVRIS more than just a risk management tool? So we will try to discuss that on the succeeding slides. For the key features of the EVRIS, the first key feature is the automated flagging of potentially undervalued goods. The keyword here is automated, which means that the system itself automatically identifies if a shipment falls below the minimum range. This feature, the automated flagging of potentially undervalued goods, is the risk management functionality of the EVRIS. For the next key feature, the EVRIS now provides for a lookup table of identical and similar entries in compliance with the WTO Valuation Agreement and the CMTA. This functionality or key feature allows our assessment personnel the capability to apply the sequential methods of valuation, specifically under Method 2 or the transaction value of identical goods and Method 3, the transaction value of similar goods. The next key feature is the availability of a specification code. So the specification codes are the coded product description list that is available to our declarant or the importer during the lodgement phase. Next, we have the scanning capability of the E2M. With the scanning capability, the examiner and appraiser can now attach import documents under the Attach Document tab of the E2M. And last but not the least, the EVRIS requires assessment personnel to indicate the valuation method used. Well, there is a mechanism in the E2M. Well, the EVRIS is actually integrated in the E2M. So there is a mechanism that mandates the examiner or the appraiser to indicate the appropriate methods of valuation use. So later on, I have an example on the last part of this presentation for us to better understand how the EVRIS works. For the legal basis of the EVRIS, it was embodied under Section 101 
or the Declaration of Policy, subsections A and B, wherein it states that it is the policy of the state, specifically the mandate of the Bureau, to develop and implement programs for the continuous enhancement of custom systems and processes that will harmonize customs procedures. And letter B, to adopt clear and transparent customs rules, regulations, policies, and procedures consistent with international standards and customs best practices. As I've mentioned on the previous slides, the EVRIS was developed specifically to be WTO compliant. For other countries, the EVRIS is actually synonymous to a national valuation database. And in fact, the national valuation database is internationally accepted practice used by several countries, including the ASEAN member states. And just this year, the ASEAN member states just issued a, an ASEAN Customs Valuation Guide, which signifies the approval of a national valuation database. Uh, further, a certain provision or section of the ASEAN Customs Valuation Guide highlights that a modern customs verification technique includes the establishment of a price range parameters and that price range parameters is essentially and practically the computerized program implemented by the bureau of customs or the evris so this implement the mandate of the bureau under section 101 to implement a modern custom system in conformity to international standards and best practices for the last part, I will discuss to you the procedure in the use of the EVRIS. This is a diagram showing the step-by-step -step procedure or a manual on how the EVRIS actually works. The first step is when the importer lodges a goods declaration in the E2M. So the lodgement of the importer is through the Value Added Service Provider or the VASP. As mentioned, as one of the key features of the EVRIS, there is now a Product Description Lease or Product Specification Code. So this specification code is available to the importer during the lodgement phase. After that, it will now be for assignment of examiner through the GDVS or the Goods Declaration Verification System. Now, the EVRIS as integrated in the custom system now automatically identifies if the shipment falls below the minimum range. At this juncture, let us all assume that I am the customs examiner. So, as, an, as a customs examiner, imagine that I have already retrieved an entry assigned to me through the GDVS. Once I retrieve the entry, the system will automatically tell me if there is a valuation hit, meaning the declared value falls below the minimum range. I will now explain to you the possible scenarios available to the examiner. For the first scenario, again, there is a valuation hit. As a customs examiner, I will not immediately upgrade the declared value just because there is a valuation hit. What I am required to do is to verify or check the documents presented by the importer. And in the event that there is reasonable doubt that exists or there is some lacking documents to support the declared value, then I will require the importer to submit it and, and inform the importer through the customer care portal system. Now, for the first scenario, assuming that the supporting documents were accepted, meaning all the documents are complete, all the documents are legitimate and authenticated. Therefore, 
the importer was able to substantiate the declared value. As an examiner, I can accept the declared value under method 1. So once I accepted the declared value under method 1 or the transaction value method, I will now input M1 in the box number 43 value or the valuation method box in the set. So this signifies that I have accepted the declared value of the importer under the transaction value method. After that, it will now proceed to the customs appraiser for final assessment, then for payment, and eventually release of goods. Now we have the second scenario. Again, let us all assume that, again, there is a valuation hit. So as mentioned earlier, as a customs examiner, I will not immediately upgrade the declared value just because there is a hit or a valuation hit. What I am required to do again is to verify the documents presented. However, let, let us assume that upon review of the documents presented, the documents are all incomplete, the documents are not authenticated, or I found some illegit illegitimate documents as submitted by the importer. In that case, I can now say that the importer failed to justify the acceptance of the declared value. So this means that the importer failed to establish that the declared value is indeed the price actually paid or payable. On that scenario, pursuant to Section 700 of the Customs Modernization and Tariff Act, if method 1 or the transaction value method was rejected, we shall now proceed with the subsequent methods of valuation. Now, here is where the EVRIS goes into the picture, wherein as an added feature or functionality of the EVRIS, the examiner or the appraiser can now access a lookup table of identical and similar entries. So this allows the assessment personnel to apply the sequential application of the methods of valuation. So in the system, the examiner will just click an I button for him or for her to view the lookup table functionality of the EVRIS. So once the examiner already viewed the lookup table, he or she shall now select the values of identical or similar entries as substitute to the declared value since method 1 is rejected. After that, the examiner is also required to indicate method 2 if transaction method transaction value of identical goods is used or method 3 if transaction value of similar goods is used. Then it will be forwarded to the customs appraiser for final assessment then for payment and release of goods. So that ends the presentation. Thank you everyone for listening and have a nice day. Thank you so much, Sir Romeo, for sharing with us your knowledge on BOC value reference system. And now to shed light on our selectivity system improvement, we are pleased to introduce to you the officer in charge for the risk management office, Ms. Jemke Flor S. Sakar. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jemke Flor Sakar, currently the Acting Chief of the Risk Management Office. Allow me to present to you the selectivity system of the Bureau of Customs. With a continuous effort to use automation to the fullest extent possible, the Bureau of Customs recently rolled out the new Universal Risk Management System, which is an enhanced cargo selectivity tool for trade facilitation. Last week, we activated the orange lane feature of the said system, which is designated for X-ray scanning with the aim to maximize the use of non-intrusive inspection through the newly installed X-ray machines, as well as to utilize the memory-based reasoning feature of the system in flagging high-risk goods for physical inspection. Also, to lessen human factor, the orange lane shall be activated 
for the purpose of delineation of scanning and physical inspection, which are both on the red lane from the previous lane channels. Now, the question probably is, how are risk levels identified? The chances of a cargo to be selected by the system to a certain color depends on many aggregate factors. Generally, this include the predictive risk coefficient, which is automatically calculated by the system. Random selection, depending on the workload capacity of the ports. Fixed criteria, which focus on generalized risks and specific criteria which focus on targeted risks. All the rules and policies are translated into the system. The Universal Risk Management System automatically reads the custom declaration and through algorithm assigns the color lane, which cannot be altered or overwritten manually. Once the declaration is assessed, the risk score or weight, depending on the findings of the customs examiners or appraisers, will be fed back to the risk profiles, calculating the risk or confidence rate through memory-based reasoning. Also, system calculates the heat, the heat rates, which is critical for the review and recalibration of criteria. The next question would probably be, how do we ensure quality data fed into the system? So there are four important components to ensure effectiveness of the universal risk management system. The first one is, of course, the quality of sor data sources coming from all, um, from all offices across the Bureau, partner agencies, and foreign counterparts. The efficacy of risk assessment on all the identified risks. The third one would be the feedback mechanism that keeps the dynamic recalibration of the selec selectivity criteria. And lastly, the holistic approach in effectively managing the risks. For data sources, the Bureau of Customs launched last October 2019 the use of Cargo Targeting System, a World Customs Organization enterprise solution, which will allow identification of high-risk shipments and facilitation of trade. This was implemented through Customs Memorandum Order Number 48-2019. The Bureau is also strengthening the National Customs Enforcement Network, which is a system developed by the WCO as well, to assist Customs Administrations with the collection and storage of law enforcement information at national level, with the additional capacity or capability to exchange this information at regional, and international levels. Through the adoption of the, net, of the NSEN, administrations are able to manage information on all aspects of their law enforcement functions, including seizures, offenses, and suspected persons or business entities. And also the Data Sources Portal, which is developed by the Bureau through the MISTG to ensure pipeline of information from all sources to the Risk Management Office. Salient features of the said systems are the following. For the CTS, advanced profiling of shipments before their ar arrival at the Philippine ports by using the manifest submit submitted electronically by shipping lines and airlines, following mandated timelines for submission. Automated querying, for efficient risk analysis and comprehensive data submitted by foreign carriers or their authorized agents that may be used for profiling, risk assessment, anti-terrorism, uh, law enforcement, and other related purposes. For NSEN, expanded data sharing allows for information gathering on non-compliance and on non-compliant um, actors as key foundation for identifying effective actions to be taken in key risk areas. Um, it also improves BOC's analytical capability in terms of targeted controls of shipments. For example, through the use of custom analytic rules enabling searches for specific criteria across all data stored in the application. 
managed information, make it um, a complex tool, building the Bureau's cap um, capacity to conduct effective risk-based and intelligence-supported customs operations. And for the data sources portal, this will, this will be the data warehouse or this will house all the data collected from all concerned BOC offices for sustainability. This is electronic submission of reports to ensure timely and relevant information and would secure data of preservation. So we have currently ongoing development on the system that would make it capable of machine learning for link analysis. For risk assessment, it is the overall process of risk identification, risk analysis, risk evaluation, and prioritization. When risks are identified, it is not merely assigning it to a certain color and dictating inspection treatment, which unfortunately is a common min misconception among those who does not who do not have um, clear knowledge or um, or background in risk management. So these risks are assessed using the risk matrix, a tool for sorry, a tool for ranking and displaying risks by defining ranges for consequence and likelihood. So including the actors or responsible office to better resolve the issues. So it is also followed by the coordinated and economical application of resources to minimize, monitor, and control the probability or impact of unfortunate events or to maximize the realization of all opportunities. So, level of resolving the risks could be strategic, operational, or tactical. It is noteworthy to mention that risks can be mitigated at different levels. If operational, RMO can automatically translate it to the selectivity system. If there is policy issue or when um, processes are involved, it must be resolved strategically. Risk can also be mit mitigated through tactical approach like pre-lodgement controls, alert orders, and outside intelligence and enforcement infor operations. So through weighing and prioritization, rather than simply accepting risk, or investing in a mitigating or mitigation action, a framework based on choices of um, treat, transfer, terminate, or tol and tolerate affords a deeper understanding of what could be gained or lost. So these choices present opportunities and consequences. Lastly, the available resources de determine the um, threshold to support risk tolerance. Um, recently, Customs Special Order 44-2019 designated the Entry Processing Unit or the equivalent office as representatives for Regional Risk Management Offices or the um, RMUs or the Risk Management Units for real-time coordination and reporting using online feedback forms to help RMO monitor the workload capacity as well as to serve as an efficient communication platform to reach the concerns per port. We have been intensifying the feedback mechanism to ensure the memory-based reasoning will be functioning properly since it is dependent on the results of inspection fed back by the customs examiners and appraisers using fraud codes. So this will automatically calculate the confidence or risk rates of cargo. The regular evaluation of detections over selections help in finding, um, helps in finding areas for improvement for creation and or evaluation of relevant laws, rules, regulations, and find better approach to assist traders in their compliance. So for a dynamic review of performance and continuous recalibration of the said selectivity screens, a sustainable feedback mechanism is necessary to check how treatments are carried out in ascertaining threats and risks through a viable and efficient reporting system. 
So these two automated features of the Universal Risk Management System are vital for the monitoring and evaluation. Um, the memory-based reasoning or the risk prediction class clusters um, comprises a complete database of risk indicators for each individual cluster, which is automatically built upon examination results. These indicators, also called MBR variables, are used by the URM system to evaluate the level of risk associated to each declaration. Also, the heat rates or the detection over selection, which the system um, of providing the correlation between select, which is the system of providing and um, the correlation between selection and detection, which, um, which is critical in increasing the batting average. This also aids decision makers in recalibrating selectivity rules or by formulating policies and programs to increase the effectiveness and efficiency of risk management system. Lastly, it is noteworthy to mention that risk management cannot be practiced in isolation. A Customs uh, Risk Management Steering Committee or, or the CRMSC was created through CSO 22-2019 to ensure that every field in risk management, um, field operations, investigations, post clearance, intelligence, tariff, valuation, and information technology um, is well represented through holistic decision making, overseeing the risk management and cargo selectivity processes, assuring integrity of those processes, monitoring the productivity of productivity of risk management office, and securing that the processes are supported throughout the BOC, and and most especially to have a risk management policy that is regularly reviewed and revised. CMO or Customs Memorandum Order 21-2020 or the Enhanced Cargo Selectivity System covered all the roles of each office in the implementation of risk management system, the operational provisions for setting and updating the selectivity screens, IT support systems, and lastly, the compliance program. So this compliance program covers internal and external compliance for a sustainable and reliable automated process. Continuous monitoring and evaluation detects gaps that hinder the achievement of, of effective selectivity process. So for this week, year, we have resolved 23 gaps for the first phase and will be resolving the 18 new gaps for the second phase. The CRMSC was also able to formulate five resolutions, including measures for COVID-19 situation, of course, and the latest would be the alignment of extra inspection prior assessment, which will be out soon in order to be parallel with the um, implementation of Orange Lane. The IT solutions, which are the URMS, CTS, NSEN, and the BSP have been rolled out. And the improved risk management system was also part of the BOC's 10-point priority program for 2020, which is almost at full realization. URMS support activities or the action plans of the CRMSC collaborators and other collaborators are already 100% completed. And lastly, the completion of the awareness program to open the communication lines between BOC offices, partner agencies, stakeholders, and risk management office to further develop measures that will aid in strengthening the integrity of the selectivity system. Our target is to achieve an optimized, continuous, and integral risk management in 2022. This is a tough journey, but through the adoption of a holistic-based compliance management approach, optimal, optimal levels of both facilitation and control can be achieved. So that would be all for the selectivity system. I hope I was able to give you a comprehensive overview of the customs risk management system as well. Um, thank you for listening. Good afternoon again. Thank you, Ms. Jemke, for that very detailed presentation. At this juncture, I would like to introduce to you the Acting Chief of the Prosecution and Litigation Division. Please welcome Attorney Julito Doria. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I am Attorney Julito Eldoria, Acting Chief of the Prosecution and Litigation Division, Legal Service, and at the same time, the Chairman of the Review Team under the Project Management Office. Today, I will discuss the salient points of Customs Administrative Order 1, that's 2020, also known as fines and surcharges for, for clerical errors, misdeclaration, misclassification, and undervaluation. This administrative order implements the following provisions of the Customs Modernization and Tariff Act. Section 108 which provides for the penalties for inadvertent errors and section 1400 which covers misdeclaration, misclassification, undervaluation in goods declaration. So the coverage of this cow includes all goods declaration for ex exportation or importation and whether for consumption, warehousing or admission. The main objective of this policy is to ensure that goods are properly declared in accordance with the procedure and deter commission of small and inadvertent mistakes. In this way, the declarant will be more attentive and vigilant in the lodgement of goods declaration. Significantly, the general provisions of CAO 1-2020 covers these three broad subjects, namely fines for clerical error, imposition of 250% surcharge, and the imposition of 500% surcharge. First, we will discuss fines for clerical error in goods declaration. Under section 4.1 of this cow, a fine of 5,000 pesos shall be imposed by the collection district for every clerical error determined to have been committed in the covering goods declaration upon lodgement thereof. For purposes of the imposition of fine, an error is considered clerical when the same is inadvertent, provided that it is not attendant with fraud and not due to gross negligence. Relatively, inadvertent error refers to a mechanical, electronic, or clerical error committed unintentionally by the declarant, which occurred notwithstanding the maintenance of internal controls necessary to avoid such errors. This may include misspelling, incorrect input of data while drafting, copying, or transposing a document. The error contemplated is committed when there is an incorrect or erroneous input of data on the following. A. Consignee's name, importing vessel or aircraft, port of departure, port of destination, and date of arrival, number and or marks of packages, the quantity, the nature, and correct commodity description of the goods contained therein, value as set forth in the invoice and packing list, and such other information as may be required by rules and regulation. Under Section 107 of the CMTA, the declarant shall be responsible for the accuracy of the goods declaration. Thus, the declarant should be careful in accomplishing the goods declaration to avoid the imposition of fine. It should also be noted that under section 4.2, the 5,000 peso fine shall be without prejudice to the imposition of additional fines or penalties for other inadvertent errors discovered 
in the Goose Declaration. Now we now we now go to the imposition of 250% surcharge. Under Section 4.2, the 250% surcharge, in addition to the assessed duties, taxes, fees, and other charges, shall be imposed when the following are present. A. Where the resulting discrepancy in duties and taxes to be paid between what is legally determined upon assessment and what is declared arose from misdeclaration, misclassification, or undervaluation. And when the discrepancy in duty and taxes to be paid between what is legally determined upon assessment by the port and what is declared amounts to 10% or more. The surcharge equivalent to 250% of the duties and taxes shall be imposed in the following instances. As I have mentioned earlier, misdeclaration, undervaluation, and misclassification. In so far as misdeclaration is concerned, it refers to the quantity of goods, the quality of goods, description of goods, the weight of goods, measurement of goods. Thus, it is imperative to define these terms so we could better understand the implications of its commission. First, what is misdeclaration? It refers to a false and truthful, erroneous or inaccurate declaration as to quantity, quality, description, weight, or measurement of the goods, resulting in deficiency between that duty and tax that should have been paid and the duty and tax actually paid. On the other hand, misclassification refers to the use of insufficient or wrong description of the goods or the use of erroneous tariff headings and subheadings resulting in this deficiency between the tax and duty that should have been paid and the duty and tax actually paid. Undervaluation, on the other hand, refers to a situation when the declared value fails to disclose in full the price actually paid or payable or any dutiable adjustment to the price actually paid or payable or when an incorrect valuation method is used or the valuation rules are not properly observed resulting in a discrepancy in duty and tax to be paid between what is legally determined as correct value against the declared value. Lastly, we discuss the imposition of the 500% surcharge. A surcharge shall be imposed equivalent to 500% of the duties and taxes due when the misdeclaration, misclassification, or undervaluation is intentional or fraudulent. The imposition of the surcharge shall be in addition to the seizure of the subject shipment. How do we determine if the misdeclaration, misclassification, or undervaluation is considered intentional or fraudulent? It is when a false or altered document is submitted, false statements or information are knowingly made, or other similar instances. Additionally, Section 6 of this order discusses the principles of prima facie evidence of fraud. It is stated that in case of misdeclaration, misclassification, or undervaluation, a discrepancy amounting to more than 30% of the duty and tax to be paid between what is legally determined and what is declared shall constitute 
a prima facie evidence of fraud. For example, if the declared duties and taxes is 10,000 pesos, but after due examination of the import documents, the examiner found that the duties and taxes to be paid is 20,000 pesos. Clearly, there is a 100% discrepancy since the duties and taxes as found is double the amount of what is declared. What is the effect of this? As I mentioned earlier, aside from the seizure of the shipment, it will be subject to the imposition of 500% surcharge. Moving forward, the following are the instances where the imposition of any surcharge may not be applied. One, when the discrepancy between the duty to be paid as legally, as legally determined upon assessment and what is declared is less than 10%. For example, the duties and taxes declared is 950 pesos, but the duties and taxes as found is 1,000 pesos. In this instance, there is only a 5% discrepancy. Thus, the imposition of surcharge will not be applied. Next, when the declared tariff heading is rejected in a formal customs dispute settlement process involving difficult or highly technical question of tariff classification, or when the tariff classification decla declaration relied on an official government ruling. To discuss, a difficult or highly technical question of tariff classification occurs when the goods are classifiable under more than one ASEAN Harmonized Tariff Nomenclature Chapter or AHTN Chapter, heading or subheading, or the product description is not specifically provided for in the AHTN subheading or heading and it will need the ruling of the Tariff Commission for its determination and resolution. Thus, although there is an erroneous declaration of tariff heading as ruled by the Tariff Commission, no surcharge shall be imposed since it went through a formal customs dispute settlement process. Next, when the declared value is rejected as a result of an official ruling or decision under the customs dispute settlement process involving difficult or highly technical question relating to applications of customs valuation rules. So to, to recapitulate, recapitulate, the first instance was technical question on classification and this one involves difficult or highly technical question on valuation and lastly when the misdeclaration misclassification or undervaluation was subjected to timely amendment and was corrected prior to final assessment or examination of the goods pursuant to section 408 of the CMTA to briefly summarize, the imposition of fine in the amount of 5,000 pesos per error shall be made if the error committed is merely clerical or inadvertent. On the other hand, the 250% surcharge shall be applied when the error committed constitutes misdeclaration misclassification or undervaluation and there is a resulting discrepancy in duty and tax to be paid between what is legally determined upon assessment and what is declared by 10% or more. And lastly, the 500% surcharge will be applied when the misdeclaration, misclassification or undervaluation is intentional or fraudulent. In closing, 
Customs Administrative Order Number no. One, das 2020, strengthens the commitment of the Bureau of Customs to ensure that all submitted documents reflect accurate data in order to arrive at the correct duties and taxes due to the government and to timely process the release of the shipments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Attorney Doria, for discussing with us the prevailing issued Customs Administrative Order on penalties, fines, and surcharges. We truly hope that everyone has been well informed throughout the presentation. At this point, for our next topic, she will be discussing Customs Accreditation, which is a prerequisite for Customs Transaction. Please welcome Customs Operations Officer 3, Evaluator of Accounts Management Office, Ms. Junichelle C. Hababag. Hello everyone, I am Junie Shell from the Accounts Management Office. Welcome to the first ever webinar of Customs Policies and Operations. I am here to talk about Customs Accreditation. And before I present to you my, I give you my presentation, I'd like to give you a bit of information about what Customs Accreditation is. Customs Accreditation is a system that supports the needs of the BOC, the Bureau of Customs, for accurate information, reliable information of stakeholders, specifically those who are engaged in importation, specifically importers and tax declarants, the professional customs brokers. It gathers and maintains data that is needed by the Bureau of Customs for a, as a risk management tool in its performance of its mandate, that is to, uh, to generate revenue to, uh, and to facilitate a fair trade. Over the years, enhancement measures were put in place to improve accreditation system of the Bureau. And just last year, the Bureau introduced Customer Care Portal System or Ticketing System. It allows online submission of applications as well as monitoring of, or the, of the progress of your applications. And in compliance with the ease of doing business, it simplified the list of requirements and also it shortened the period, the processing period. And as of the moment, at present, the uh, customs accreditation is handled by an ad hoc unit called AMO, Accounts Management Office that is under the intelligence group. So that's a bit of information for you. And now, let's proceed with my presentation. I am going to discuss two topics, that is the requirements of accreditation of importers and brokers and the steps on how to apply for accreditation. Now, let's start with my presentation. Of course, we are guided by Customs Memorandum Orders. Under Customs Memorandum Order Number 11 2014 and Customs Memorandum Order 31 2019. Now, these two CMO uh, list down the, the list of requirements and the procedures of accreditation. If you want to check the contents of the CMO, this is available at our website at customs.gov.ph. Check it out. Okay, next, let's discuss first the requirements for importers. Who are importers? Importers refers to, it can be a sole proprietorship, corporations, partnership, or cooperatives. So these are the list of the requirements. Madami siya tingnan, pero pag tinignan mo siya, some of the requirements is not applicable for sole proprietorship and some are for corporations. So allow me to discuss to you one by one the requirements. Okay, start with application form. Okay. Okay. Let me tell you that if you forgot to, to memorize or this is actually posted at the portal. 
Okay. First requirement, application form. Okay. Application form, this is available. This is a prescribed format. The form is available. It can be downloadable at our portal. So, okay. Remember, this is a sworn document. You have to declare accurate information. It includes your address, warehouse, email of the company, contact numbers, importable items, and it should be signed and notarized. And affix a 2 by 2 photo of the applicant. Now, I have a question. Sino lang pwede po merma ng application form? Okay. For sole proprietorship, proprietor lang ang pwede po merma. It's the sole proprietor. For corporations, it should be anyone sa mga officers or they can designate a person from the company to represent the, to represent the company and to sign the application form. And for cooperatives, it should be the chairman. And for partnership, it should be one of the partners. Okay. And next, we have, okay, one of the requirements is that you have to declare yung designated signatory sa goods declaration. So for corporations, kailangan submit corporate secretary certificate that, uh, stating therein yung names of signatory in the goods declaration. And that ilalagay doon yung signatures, specimen signatures of entry signatories or goods declaration signatories. And for partnership, partnership resolution, of course. For cooperatives, cooperative resolution. And for sole proprietorship, affidavit of proprietor, a sole signatory of the import entry. I repeat, for sole proprietorship, si sole proprietor lang ang pwede po merba sa goods declaration. Okay? So next. So, that's an example. Okay. And next, we have, okay, for corporations, we require general information sheet. So, latest GIS. Paano kung hindi pa available na GIS? For example, kaka-establish lang ng company. Okay. In lieu of the GIS, the corporation shall submit complete list of SEC Certificate of Registration, Articles of Corporation, Articles of Cooperative, and Bylaws. Kapag walang GIS, yun. Okay, this is an example of GIS. Okay, it should be latest. Nandyan ang list of stockholders and officers of the company. Okay. Okay. And for sole proprietorship, this is only for sole proprietorship, DTI registration. So, with the DTI registration, it bears the name of the company, the name of the owner, and the validity of the registration. Okay. And certification or registration. It should be valid. That's for sole proprietorship. Okay. For partnership, ang isasabit naman is it, SEC registration and articles of partnership. So again, nandiyan ang business name, the list of partners, and other contents of the, the, the articles of partnership. And of course, for cooperatives, CDA registration and articles of cooperative. Okay, that's an example. Okay. Okay, next, BIR registration. Now, this is very important because this is the basis of our tax identification number. Now, BIR registration, this is an example. Nandiyan ang TIN, tax identification number of the company, the address, the business name, and the line of business. Okay, it's a form, BIR form 2303. And next, mayor's permit. Okay, remember, the mayor's permit of office address lang. No need to submit the mayor's permit of the warehouse. Just the mayor's permit of the office address. So, this is an example. Again, nandun ang business name, the owner, the address, the location of the office address, and the, kind, and the nature of business. And it should be signed by the city mayor, and it should be valid and certified by the business permit and licensing office. The one who issued this, the mayor's permit. Okay, and 
Next is income tax return. Income tax return for the past three years. So we are requiring for the past three years. There are times na hindi pa ito applicable sa isang company. For example, na-issue ang BIR registration 2018, so yung available lang to submit ITR is 2018 and ITR for 2019. Okay? So, depende ito sa issuance ng date of registration nila sa BIR. Okay? But our requirement is for the past 3 years. That's an example. Depende yung form kung anong firm na sinasubmit ko sa BIR. So, 1702 for corporation, 1701 for sole proprietorship. Okay. Next, we have company profile. Now, company profile, ang content nito is you give us a background of your company. So, it may, it may include uh, the, uh, the history of the company, what kind of business you are engaged in, and then, of course, affiliations, officers, okay? And then, now, um, one example, and it also includes the pictures of the office and warehouse premises, okay? Now, for the pictures of the warehouse, it should, for the pictures of the office, rather, it should be latest, okay? You have to submit a sh a sh interior shots of the office and the exterior shots of the office and a photo of the permanent and proper signage. Again, proper and permanent signage, not a bond paper. It should be a permanent and proper business signage. You have to take a photo of your business signage at the office premises. So interior shots and exterior shots of the office premises. And for warehouse premises, you, ha you have also to, to submit a photo, the exterior and the interior shots of the warehouse, of the storage premises. Okay? It should be clear photo. It should be clear. Okay, next, we have proof of lawful occupancy of office and warehouse premises. Okay, example of, uh, of lawful occupancy proof. If you are renting this contract, if you are not renting, if the company owns the property, a copy of land title. Papano kung ang land title ay nakapangalan sa iba? So, the, the owner of the property must execute an affidavit of consent or a certification that he is allowing that company to occupy the premises for business purposes for free and for how long. So those are examples. And if it's a sublease or they are sharing, the lesser shall issue a certification that he is allowing sharing of office in sublease. Okay. So example, yeah. Land title, contract of lease. The contract of lease should be valid. Okay. Next, sketch or location of office and warehouse address. So, it can be a Google shot or pwede rin mag-drawing kayo, mag-sketch. Paano papunta doon? Yung sketch papunta sa office and warehouse address. Yeah, Google shot or sketch. Pwede. Basta clear at maayos. Nakikita doon kung papaano papunta doon sa, sa address. And next, proof of financial capacity to import goods. Okay. You have to show to us that you have the financial capability to import goods. Okay. Example, bank certificate. Okay. And other example is credit facility. So, those are examples of proof. But if you don't have a bank certificate, if credit facility, you can actually submit to us a proof as long as you can explain, you can show, you can, you can show that you have the, the, the financial capability to, to import goods and to engage in business. Okay. Okay, next is NBA clearance. NBA clearance should be not more than three months old and it should be original. Okay. Sino ang magsasubmit ng NBA clearance? Applicant lang po ang magsasubmit ng NBA clearance. Okay. Applicant lang meaning nung nagpirma ng application form. Siya lang ang magsasubmit ng NBA clearance. Okay. Two valid government issued ID with picture of responsible officers. Question. Sino ang mga responsible officers and principal officers? Now, ang magsasubmit ng ID ay yung mga responsible officers. Una, 
the applicant, yung pumirma na application form. And second, yung signatory sa import entries. And third, the president. And any other person na declare as responsible officers ng company. Okay. And ito yung mga example ng acceptable IDs. SSS, passport, drivers, PRC ID, UMID. And for foreigners, kailangan submit passport and a copy of a valid ACR and AAP. Ito yung ini-issue ng immigration, alien certificate of registration, and alien employment permit. That That's for foreigners. Okay. Alright. Personal profile. Okay. Yung nag-submit ng ID, magsasubmit din siya ng personal profile. Okay. Personal profile, prescribed form to. This is available sa portal. So, have it printed and then fill up. Should be signed with the person and should have fixed photo. So, again, yung magsasubmit ng personal profile, responsible officers, the applicant, the entry signatories, the president, and other person na designate as responsible officers. Okay. CPRS profile. Now, this is a requirement na kailangan, you have to be registered first sa CPRS. And you have to avail, para magkaroon ka nito, you have to avail the services of value-added service providers. So, CPRS profile, ito yung contents ng CPRS, pareho lang siya sa application form. So, dapat, yung nakalagay sa application form, is pareho sa i-declare mo sa CPRS. So, it should be, you have to declare complete address, complete warehouse address, uh, correct email, contact numbers, foreign supplier, the basis of foreign, the, and major stockholder rather, the basis of major stockholder yung nakalagay sa GIS na sinadmit ninyo. Okay? But for sole proprietorship, walang ganito, walang major stockholder. Iba rin ang form ng sole proprietorship. And of course, responsible officer. So you have to declare, you have to upload the photo, tapos yung names and contact numbers of responsible officers. So nandudun lahat yan sa CPRS. Okay. And kapag successful yung pag-storage sa system ng CPRS profile, there will be a notification na successfully sent siya. Okay. Ito yung example. Okay. Address, principal officers, major supplier. Okay. And lastly, of course, processing fee. So we have 1,010 processing fee. So there are two options that you have kung paano magbayad ng processing fee. First, over the counter, you can pay at any at cash division of the nearest customs district. So all you have to do is print the order of payment. Nandun niya sa portal, i-print mo yung order of payment and then present it sa cash division and then Doon ka magbayad ng processing fee and then they will issue you a green copy of the receipt. Or, pwede naman through Paymaya. So, kung gusto mo, yes, you can pay through Paymaya. So, sa application, you have to pay registration, accreditation fee through Paymaya. AMO will send you an invoice, tapos confirmation, and then print mo yun. Okay, that's an example of the invoice. Okay. That's for importers. And now let's proceed with brokers. Registration of customs brokers. Okay. These are the list of requirements for customs brokers. Okay. Number one. Application form. So again, the, the form is available at the portal. Have it printed and then fill it out. Should be completely filled out. So... These are the personal details of the broker. Answer some questions and then a fixed, fo a fixed photo and signatures and your top mark. And have it notarized. It should be original. Okay. Of course, processing fee. You have two options to pay through Paynaya or over the counter at cash division near at the nearest port district. Hey Maya, you can also pay. Okay, next is PRC ID. Okay, for customs brokers, a copy of the PRC ID, a valid PRC ID, and NBA clearance, a valid NBA clearance also, original. 
Okay. Of course, you have to submit. If you have clients, submit list of clients with complete address and contact details. Now, if you don't have yet client, mag-submit ka na ng affidavit that you don't have clients. Okay. Pag meron, may form, you have to fill it out and then submit it to us. This form is available also at the portal. Okay, list of representatives. Some brokers, some customs brokers have representatives. So, just fill out the form. Again, we have a form for that. Nasa portal yan. Fill out mo lang yan. If wala ka pang representatives, submit an affidavit of no representatives. Okay. Now, again, CPRS profile. CPRS for customs brokers. So, you... Okay, this is the CPRS for customs brokers. You have to avail the services of a service provider, value-added service provider. Okay, you have to fill this out, address, and list of your clients if you have. So, that's for customs brokers, CPRS. And again, if this is successfully sent to the system, you will receive a notification. Alright? Okay, BIR registration, 2303. For brokers, we are requiring BIR registration. So, and then the name the broker, the team, and the line of business, customs broker age. Okay. And ITR. So, ITR for the past three years, if applicable. So, kung bago ka pa lang, kung 2019 ka pa lang, so 2019 lang ang ITR na sasabit mo. Just a copy of your income tax return. This is an example of ITR. For customs broker, so 1701. Okay. Okay, don't worry. Yung list ng broker's requirements available din yan sa portal as well as yung importer's list. So, pwede nyo balikan yun. Yung listahan. And then lastly, requirements sa customs brokers is certificate of good standing issued by APO. By the, as of now, it is the Chamber of Customs Brokers Incorporated who issue a certificate of good standing for customs broker. So it should be latest, it should be valid. This is an example of a certificate of good standing. That's it. Okay. So those are the requirements for brokers and importers. Now, where can we get the required forms? Again, sinabi ko kanina, it's available sa portal. So client at customs that customs.gov.ph so under FAQ open mo yun nandun lahat ng forms na prescribed format so application form eto yung mga forms na pwede mo i-download na available ayan for importers application form order of payment eto yung pagbabayad mo sa OR and then personal profile for new brokers again application form order of payment list of clients representatives and personal profile alright Okay, let's proceed. Ito na, kompleto ka na sa requirements. Now, let's proceed. mag a ka na. Now, I'm gonna show you on how the steps to submit online application. Okay, magsasubmit ka na ng accreditation. Okay, there are two steps na gagawin mo before ka makapag-submit online. First, you have to be registered. Okay, so dapat may email ka na nakaprepare para mag-register ng user account mo. Okay. Ito. Pag nag-open ka sa portal, client.customs.gov.ph, ito yung lalabas. So, ayan. So, ito yung forms. Pakita ko. Yung forms. Ito yung forms. So, i-show ko lang ha. Yung kanina mga forms. Ito, FAQ. Ayan. So, nandun lahat. Nandun na mga forms. Okay. So, ito yung favorite portal natin. So, i-open mo lang yung portal, yung client.customs.gov.ph, dun ka na rin magsasubmit. Okay, una, registration muna. So, okay, open browser client.customs.gov.ph. Okay, ayan ang lalabas. And then, click mo yung sign in, lalabas yung account registration. Ayan. So, fill out mo yung registration. Ayan. 
So you have to fill out the details, provide details, your email, and password. And then after mo siya ma-fill out, click mo siya sa baba register. Okay. After niyan, may confirmation. So yung confirmation na yun, mag mag magbibigyan ka ng link sa email mo. So to check, to check it, to confirm your account, open mo ang email mo. And then, nandun yung link. Tapos, yan. Account confirmed. So, meron ka ng account sa portal. So, now you are ready to submit your application. Okay. Step 3. How to submit application for it. Now that you have an account sa portal, magsasubmit ka na ng application mo. Okay. Step 1. Again, ang ating favorite portal, client.customs.gov.ph, doon ka mag-open ng ticket. Now, pag in-open mo yan, dapat ready na yung scan documents mo. In-scan mo na all your requirements. So, eto. Sa lower part, open a new ticket. Sign in ka muna sa user account mo, and then mag-upgrade to. Open a new ticket. Okay. Select topic or transaction. Halimbawa, mag apply ka as importer. So, lalag ipipiliin mo doon, new importer. Tapi. And then, sa baba niyan, input ka ng issue summary. Ang ilalagay mo kapag importer, company name. Okay? Tapos, pag na-input mo na yung company name, Below that, dun mo na i-upload. There is an icon there. Choose them. Ayun. Piliin mo yon, then i-upload mo isa, yung documents. Now, I suggest sa pag-upload ng documents na it should be per subject. For example, application form, GIS, mayor's permit. Tapos, bawat isa, lalagyan mo ng label yung file sa pag-upload. PDF file. Okay, para organize. Okay. So, na, na after mo ma-upload, i-click mo na yung sa baba. Okay. Create ticket. Ayan. Pag na-click mo na yun, na-successful, na-send mo na yung scan documents, create. Ayan na mag appear Create ticket. Pag na-create mo yung ticket mo, ayan na makikita mo. Meron ka ng ticket number. Nasa upper part. Ticket number. Okay? Meron ka ng ticket number. That's your transaction ticket number sa pag-apply. Okay, print mo yung ticket number and i-attach mo yun sa hard copy ng folder mo. Okay. Now that you're finished with online application, and again pala, pwede mo ma makonfirm doon sa kung successful din, pwede mo ma-check sa email mo. Okay. So, nakuha. Don't worry. Nandiyan din sa FAQ ang step-by-step -step procedure kung paano to. So, hindi mo agad maka, kung hindi mo ma-capture agad yung procedure, pwede mo naman balikan yan. Nandiyan sa FAQ. Hanapin mo lang doon yung client, yung portal, yung FAQ sa portal. Nandun ang step-by-step -step procedure kung paano mag-register and paano mag-submit online. So, don't worry. Makukuha mo yan. Okay. Now that you have submitted online, ano nang gagawin? Aantayin mo na lang. Okay. So, may ticket ka na. Successful. Eto. Ang gagawin mo na ngayon, is submit the hard copy to Customer Care Center Receiving Section. Receiving Area. So, remember, all applicants are required to submit first documents online. So, after mo makuha yung ticket, masubmit mo online, you have to submit the hard copy sa CCC, sa Customer Care Center. Later on, I will give you the address para makita nyo kung saan sa submit. So, okay, i-print mo yung copy ng ticket, isama mo din sa folder. Okay. Now, nasubmit mo na ang form, you have your ticket, and then mag-aantay ka ng status mo. Nasubmit mo na rin yung hard copy sa Bureau of Customs. Let's go now sa processing. Ilang araw ba nga antayin mo sa processing? Okay. So, sa ngayon, 
seven working days from receipt of said application, your application, makakatanggap ka ng status. Actually, three to five working days, makakatanggap ka na ng status sa portal. So, monitor mo lang yon. So, don't, huwag mong wala yun ang ticket number mo. So, para pa nag-follow up ka sa portal, makikita mo yon. So, you will be needing that ticket number to track your the status of your application. So, we have the Bureau of Customs, pero kami seven working days to process your application. Ayan, seven. So, there is a meme for that. Seven working days. Okay? Now, what about na-receive na yung folder, na-receive na yung application mo, and then may findings sa folder mo, may findings doon sa sinabit mo sa documents, may discrepancy. Okay? The account management office will notify you of those findings. So, we will not, AMO will notify you within seven working days to answer doon sa findings. Or if needed, submit documents. Now, within seven working days, pag hindi mo siya nasubmit, the ticket will be closed, it will be disapproved, and you will be notified na disapproved yung application mo. And then, we will return the folder. Okay? So, ayan. So, seven working days processing, you notify, you are given seven working days to answer if there are findings. Okay. Halimbawa, okay na, approve ka na. Pag na-approve ka na, customs accreditation is valid for a year from date of approval. You will be issued a certificate of registration. Now, a certificate of registration is automatically generated by the system. So, once approved, you will be notified and you will receive a computer-generated certificate of registration. And then, the certificate of accreditation, makiklaim mo yun sa customer care center din, kung saan mo sinabmit yung accreditation folder, yung hard copy na folder. Now, this is an example of certificate of registration. Ito na yung accreditation, yung certificate of registration. So, it, so it bears the CCN number, a unique number, and then your TIN, your company name, nature of business, and the expiration date. So remember, it is valid only for a year. So meaning, may renewal siya yearly. Okay? Okay. Now, take note of this information. So, ito yun. Ito yung portal where to submit and where to get the forms. And to submit the application, the hard copy of application form sa Bureau of Customs Customer Care Center, I'm receiving this, Gate 3, Port Area, Manila. And also, the certificate will be released also dun din. And if you are outport, nasa labas ka ng NCR, the nearest district office. So, those are the requirements. Those are the steps. Pwede nyo siyang balikan. Nakapost yun sa portal. So, kung dating kakalimut yung favorite portal natin, client.cosnet.gov.ph, nandun ang FAQ, kung paano mag-register, kung paano mag-submit, what are the forms na pwede mong i-download doon, and then how to submit step by step. Okay? Those are the requirements. And so, uh, take note of those information. And then, so as of September, Account Management Office uh, accredited 15,797 importers and 2,572 brokers. So, ayun. So for, if you have questions, you may call this number. So we have also our landing. All right. Okay, that's it. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much, Ms. Junichelle, for that presentation. And for our last speaker to discuss the E2M stabilization is the officer in charge of technology management system under the MISTG. Please welcome Mr. Jonathan Soriano. For so many years, BOC's users and stakeholders perceived the BOC system as slow, unreliable, always down, especially on a Friday. I am here to show that we have noted the issues and has implemented solutions to keep the E2M system running until a replacement system is acquired. E2M stabilization 
came about through a recommendation by the World Bank Group. World Bank conducted an assessment of BOC's current IT infrastructure and recommended IT stabilization action items that will improve the current E2M system. Uh, the World Bank recommended an upgrade of BOC's virtual infrastructure, conducting of data archiving, replacement of the ASICUDA engine, and implement a network upgrade. Uh, in response to the World Bank recommendation for E2M stabilization, BOC implemented the following is projects for hardware and for hardware uh, we we implemented the high performance private cloud server we procured a co-location server for database and acquired a disaster recovery server on the software part uh, the custom system maintenance and support was implemented we also acquired a database database license and support and upgrade and an upgrade of the database of the of the BOC's database and for network backup uh, we implemented a network redundancy project uh, to to take over the network when the net when the primary network goes down to improve our ICT infrastructure BOC uh, implemented a private cloud environment. A private cloud infrastructure is a cloud computing environment dedicated for BOC use and set up on site on BOC's data center. It will provide easy, an easily manageable, flexible, and reliable high capacity environment to host BOC systems and database. For our uh, for our application system, we utilize a private cloud on the high performance server. And for the database environment, we acquired an Oracle, Oracle private cloud to host our database servers. Another component of the E2M stabilization is the E2M software maintenance and support. Since 2013, the custom, the custom system has been running without support and upgrade. Imagine your car without any maintenance running on 20, uh, since 2013. Uh, this will obviously encounter problems and will bug down. Uh, E2M since 2013 has been maintained only by MISTG, which has no capacity to address bugs and fix issues. Since 2013, BOC has also, has also attempted to procure an upgraded or a new custom system, but this has not been successful. To compensate for the failed procurements of a new system, a maintenance and support project was acquired to keep the e current E2M system operating until a new custom system is, is implemented. This will provide a database update, decommission the ASICUDA engine, uh, up, up, update the application, and fix the issues and bugs on the current system. Uh, shown here are the current uh, achievement of the E2M software maintenance and support. Notable, notable on this are the URMS or the, or the Universal Risk Management System and the EVRIS or the Enhanced Valuation Reference Information System. These modules have been implemented in the current custom system since May and August 2020 and BOC has uh, and the BOC system has benefited from a better risk management system and better valuation system. The bottom line for this is 
E2M maintenance and support can now address all issues and en enhancement needed to keep the custom system running. For the infrastructure upgrade, uh, the following infrastructure upgrades were done. We have transferred the BOC database to the Oracle private cloud server. We have transferred the E2M application on the high performance server. Upgraded the Oracle database from the current 10G to, the car to a later model of Oracle 12C. We created a backup Oracle database to ensure database uh, availability. We have ongoing creation of uh, another database uh, in a real application cluster environment. Uh, the effect of these upgrades uh, resulted in uh, in noticeable E2M performance and reliability. Currently, the E2M system is, has experienced no slowdown or downtime since the upgrade were done. On the network side, uh, we, we will set up this year a network redundancy solution uh, through our network backhaul project. This project is intended to strengthen our back backbone network infrastructure to, to ensure continuous system availability and delivery of online services in all BOC ports. It is an outsourced managed service for two years and, when, and will provide a, high, a higher speed internet and one connection to all BOC ports. To complement the IT infrastructure and software maintenance uh, solutions, we also implemented support systems that will further enhance the BOC ICT environment. To complement the E2M stabilization projects, BOC in also implemented IT systems automation. Uh, we implemented the Modified Goods, goods Declaration Verification System, which is a web-based application designed to promote transparency efficiency through random assignment of import entries to BOC examiners and appraisers, thereby eliminating face-to-face -face transaction. We implemented a document tracking system, which is a web-based application that allows monitoring and tracking of documents received and generated by various offices of the BOC to improve processing time and in compliance with the Republic Act numbers 11032, otherwise known as ease of doing business. We implemented the alert order monitoring system, which is an application that tracks the status of alert orders from the time of issue until its resolution. The systems allow BOC to comply with the processing time requirements for alerts as provided in the Customs Modernization and Tariff Act. Number four, we implemented the Customer Care Portal System or the BOC ticketing system. It is designed to enable importers and brokers to obtain real-time information on the status of their filed goods declaration through the use of desktop browsers or smartphones. The system allows the BOC stakeholders to electronically submit their concerns with the Bureau. The stakeholders can post their complaints, feedback, suggestions online, and can also upload documents using this portal. And number five, we implemented the Parcel and Balik Bayan Box Tracking System, which is an online verification system designed to, prov to provide stakeholders with immediate information and the status of their parcel and break buy and box upon entering BOC. Uh, the new custom system is still uh, still years away until implemented. So we implemented project to stabilize the current system until we acquired a new custom system. Uh, we have 
we know that this is a continuous process and we will continue to implement enhancement to ensure that our stakeholder get the best service needed. So that ends my presentation. Thank you.